Hello, everyone. I'm Kathleen Rourke, Executive Director of Educational Sales and Marketing at Candlewick Press, and I'm incredibly happy to be introducing this first episode in the second season of the Black Creator Series, Bringing Books to Your Classroom Community, a collaboration between the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewick Press. This evening, we have the honor of hearing award-winning author Kekla Magoon in conversation with Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. Shortlisted for the National Book Award and recipient of five-starred reviews, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther's Party Promised to the People is nothing short of a masterwork of nonfiction. Revolution in Our Time is a must-read for educators and young people and a must-have for American history curriculum. We invite you to use the comments section to ask questions. Welcome and enjoy the conversation. Hecla, it's so good to see you. How are you? Good. I'm I'm quite good, in fact. How are you? I, I'm good, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but it seems like you are having an incredible fall. You are a National Book Award finalist for the book that I just cannot stop thinking about and talking about, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People, and I'm going to pull this up for everyone to see. Congratulations, Kekla, on this much-deserved honor. It is just an incredible, an incredible book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, and as you can see from all of my, all of my flags, how loved this book is for me. I mean, I just am a student of, of this book and it's just <laughs> incredibly compelling. Can you tell us why, why did you write Revolution in Our Time and what was the process like? The, the process has been quite long. <laughs> uh, I actually started working on this book over 10 years ago and it's been kind of in the background of everything that I've been doing since then. Uh, my very first novel, The Rock and the River, is about a boy in 1968 Chicago whose father is a civil rights activist and then his older brother joins the Black Panther Party, leaving my character torn and confused about what his, his own place in the movement is going to be. And that book came out in 2009 and I also did a companion novel for that book that's called Fire in the Streets about a girl named Maxie who is you know, has the, the desire to be a Black Panther, she's 14, and, um, and and starts on that process as well in the same world as The Rock and the River. And, um, and so when these books were coming out, they were the first and, and then very quickly among the first um, books for young readers, for middle grade readers, for high school readers that featured the Black Panther Party at all in fiction. And then, um, you know, they I was very lucky that they were nominated for awards and, <laughs> and won various things and got some attention. And um, teachers and librarians started using them in the classroom and coming to me with the question of where else can we find out about the Black Panthers for this age group, what other resources can we share with our students? And at that time, there really wasn't a whole lot. I mean, there wasn't anything that had been published in the nonfiction realm about the Black Panther Party. There wasn't much beyond my own books that had been published in the fiction realm. And to take what was out in the sort of adult market um, and transfer it to a middle school or high school curriculum would have been a lot of work for someone. <laughs> and so um, I set up about the process of writing this book. So again, that was way back in 2009, 2011, 2012, when I first started thinking about this and knowing that it was something that was needed. And for me, the, 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 the impetus behind writing the, the nonfiction, as well as the impetus for writing those fiction pieces, was just my own lack of awareness and understanding of the Black Panthers that I grew up with. Um, I always had the impression of this one sort of snapshot, Black men with guns, and then the feeling and emotion that I had attached to that was black, bad, scary, right? Like Black men with guns, bad, scary. We push it away. We don't even talk about it. Um, and, and so I was very surprised to discover <laughs> when I was a grant writer in New York that the Black Panther Party had a free breakfast program for school children. I just stumbled upon an article about it when I was trying to fundraise for a, a contemporary food program. And I read that article going, wait, what? This doesn't compute Black Panthers? free breakfast, school children, like this is not at all the image that I have. Uh -huh. And so the more I learned about them, the more excited I became about the work they had done, but also the more angry I became about 
the way that this history had been kept from me and the way that it was continuing to be kept from young readers today and young people today, even especially as we are rebuilding a whole movement around the same issues that the Panthers fought against, police brutality, white supremacy, right? The need for black education, the need for black history to be taught as part of education. And, um, you know, that was actually one of the Panthers key um, sort of platform tenants was education and the need to understand how we got to the place we are today. And so I hope that this book will be a part of that conversation and um, bring some new knowledge to people um, who may have that same snapshot that I started with black men with guns. And, you know, I want to transform that snapshot. I want to see what's behind it. I want to expand it and kind of explode it and, and help people see the truth. I want to thank you for illuminating the, um, the critical role and contributions of women in the Black Panther Party. Um, what else do you think might be surprising to um, to young readers and maybe what's surprising for you as research, as you researched, what do you think might be surprising? Yeah, I mean, definitely the prominence of women in the party, I think is surprising to many people at points in the Black Panther Party's lifespan. Uh, it was in fact, majority women. And um, the median age of Panthers was also very young. The median age was 19. And median means if you lined up all the Panthers in one row and started counting from the outside in, <laughs> when you got to the middle, that person would be 19, which means more than half or roughly half you know, of the Panthers were at least 19 or younger. Um, and so I think that for me, one of the more surprising things I've learned in, in studying the civil rights movement, broadly speaking, in more depth, um, is just how prominent the role of young people, meaning middle school kids, high school kids, college age students, right? How prominent the role of young people was in making that change and in leading that movement. I think that we're taught about the grownups. We're taught about people like Rosa Parks. In fact, Rosa Parks was chosen for her role in the movement because she was this older, you know, respectable, quote unquote, respectable, right, woman um, who seemed to have this particular sensibility about her, this particular aura about her. She was a profound activist in her own right, but the image that she presented was something people were interested in, right? There was a young activist named Claudette Colvin, among other people who had done a similar protest, right? Uh, several years before, and um, and that was you know part of a landmark court case, right? That ultimately helped overturn segregation. But that's not the image that the movement chose to hold up, right? We chose to hold up the image of adults. We chose to hold up, you know, the Reverend Dr. King, who was an impressive leader, but the majority of people who were out there marching and protesting were actually really really young. And I think that we deliberately teach that history. Um, in a veiled way, we, we deliberately teach that history in a flawed way because we as a culture want to strip young people of their power, not rec give them the ability to recognize their power. Um, and so for me, the, one of the more surprising things is to realize how untrue that is, how false that narrative is, that it's the grownups that make change, it's the kids that make change. It always has been and it always will be and the things that young people are doing right now today that everybody's going, oh, you know, these young people, right? Like that is the change. That's the change that we'll be writing about 50 years from now, the way that I'm writing about the Panthers. Um, um, that's really powerful. Yeah. yeah, it's so powerful because I'm thinking about, you know, the ways that I struggled through some of my history and social studies courses, just imagine if they were um, steeped in that um, perspective that it was the young people um, at any point in time who were the revolutionaries um, yeah. and how much, how engaging that would be for young people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think for most people who don't know more than that snapshot, right, pretty much everything about the Panthers is surprising. It's surprising how, um, you know, many food programs they had for their community. They did a lot of union organizing and labor organizing. They organized for workers' rights and tenants' rights. They staged boycotts around the community against businesses that were exploitative in various ways. Um, you know, they tried to really support Black-owned businesses and businesses that were owned by people within the community as opposed to, you know, some random corporation <laughs> that owns um, businesses that, that um, you know, are, are either paying unfair wages or charging a lot of money um, for the products that people really need, like groceries. Um, they were very big into voter rights and, um, you know, running candidates for office to try to change the system from within. Um, you know, this was a revolution of ideas more than it was a revolution in the streets with guns. That wasn't their vision. Their vision was, we will protect ourselves against the violence that's happening to us, 
But the revolution that we want is in our minds, it's in our hearts, it's in our ability to stand up with self-determination and say, this is what we want, this is what we need. And hey, the powers that be aren't giving it to us, so we're gonna go get it for ourselves. And they mm -hmm. proved that they could do that and that by standing together as a community, they could get the things that they need. And we all could have the things that we need if people really stood up together and demanded them and stood up together and provided them. And that, not the guns, was the scarier idea to the powers that be. And caused the US government to essentially try to destroy the Panthers. And I also think it's going to be surprising for kids to learn about um, the ways the Black Panthers were so incredibly strategic, the networking and the reach, all without social media. Um, and there are important lessons there, I think, especially in a time when so many young people can't imagine life before social media or how to function in their own individual daily lives, much less organizing a national movement, international even. So I'm wondering what connection do you think young people can see as they read revolution in our time um, between powerful black social movements like the Black Panther Party and um, Black Lives Matter or other social movements today? Uh, you talked about how important the role of young people are. What's the connection that you think kids will be able to see and make? I think, I think there's a couple of layers of connection. I mean, I think that's the whole, the whole thing is this idea of layers, right? That we are not, you know, isolated creatures existing in this time and space where nothing that has gone before and nothing that will come after those layers and layers and layers, right? Um, and, and so one of those layers is just the history of activism and the history of organizing and to have that history be taught and talked about in a way that does connect to young people and in a way that does reflect the, the truth and the complexity and the nuance of what those protest movements were. I think that that is a really powerful um, you know, underpinning for the movement that's happening today. There is, there is a lot of direct connection in terms of the specific issues that we're trying to confront, right? We are, um, we are confronting police brutality in a continued way. We are confronting white supremacy. We are confronting um, bias in education. We are confronting equal access in education, right? There are all of these things, the things that people are taking to the streets about, you know, a lot of that is police brutality, but that was that was what the, the sort of impetus for the Panthers movement in the first place was, was that mm -hmm. police brutality was happening. And so the fact that we have not seen a, a complete transformation in that landscape. Um, and in some ways, I would argue we may be in a slightly worse place <laughs> than we were at the time. I mean, that's a, definitely an arguable point. But when you think about what the Panthers did, which was to arm themselves with legal weapons and walk around their community um, and, you know, follow the police, watch the police, what they were doing, figure out what, you know, what they could do to support people who were being arrested to make sure that, you know, things weren't happening in dark alleys outside of anybody's vision, right? Like police had a lot of power in that landscape. Police still have a lot of power in our landscape. I don't think you can see an armed group of young black people walking around after the police today in, without yeah. the tragedy happening immediately, right? And certainly yeah. plenty of Panthers were confronted and killed by police, but it wasn't during their patrolling activities. It was <laughs> largely brought upon them by the police in various ways. Um, and that's a sort of complicated, aspect of the conversation. But the core point is that we are still confronting police brutality. The, the idea that the Panthers had of following the police to witness what they were doing and make sure they were acting in legal ways is being replicated today with the use of social media, with the use of um, cell phone cameras, right? People who see police stopping people are now in the practice of stopping and filming, right? We've seen this happen over and over and over again right. because that idea still stands. If we witness what the police are doing, they have to act lawfully or face consequences. And that was something that wasn't happening before the Panthers. They weren't facing consequences because there were no witnesses and there was no way within our bias structure to, to enforce proper behavior, to enforce lawful behavior by people with a great deal of power. And so I think that our movements today are still looking for ways to enforce proper behavior from people who have a lot of power. And those ways are looking different. They're looking like social media. They're looking like different kinds of protests. They're looking um, always like collective community organizing, right? Strength in numbers, marching. We've had the largest protests 
in our nation's history have taken place in the last couple of years, even though it has not all been televised because we know the revolution will not be televised. Right. And we've been saying that since the 60s, right? right. Um, and so, you know, I think that the bridge that needs to be made is between the elders who experienced the civil rights movement and then the young people who are taking to the streets today, I think that we need to bridge that, that gap. And one of the things I say in the book in one way or another, and one of the things I say in my talks <laughs> is that I think that to have a successful movement today in our landscape, we have to bridge that wisdom of the experience, right? From what has happened in the past with the energy of youth and the vision that they have for the future that they want. Like how can we bring those things together and have them make us stronger and not, um, not feel like we're reinventing the wheel because we're not. This, this movement has been taking place for decades for centuries and it has looked different ways and it's going to look different ways now but we have to know we're building on a legacy we can't feel like we're starting from scratch no i think that is so key and important for educators to hear you know if you are teaching about the black lives matter movement and you're not putting that in conversation with the black panther party um then we need to rethink that some some educators are putting it in conversation with the civil rights movement but to to keep the black panther party out um is is a mishap that i hope your book will um help educators see the importance of doing you use this incredibly powerful metaphor of an earthquake across revolution in our in our time which also works so powerfully with the structure of the book where you have these sections you you name them spark kindling blaze and then embers and i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more um, about the comparison that you're making here and why and how that maybe ties into what you were saying about the importance of kids understanding the history of, of activism because you know we could almost take this structure and apply it to several um, different points across the history of the United States, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's I think there's I think there's a couple of different metaphors in play in the book, and I think that. Yeah. I do think they work together, at least I hope they work together. Um, uh, and part of that is, you know, I, I, this is a complex and nuanced thing and I want different images. I think different images are valuable for different aspects of it, but also different images speak to different people in different ways. And so I'm trying to have this book reach a lot of different people and connect in a lot of different ways. And so for me, those two things are related. The idea of the earthquake, right? The idea that there is, there is this, this structure underneath us, right? The very land that we stand on that can be disrupted in ways that feel sudden like shake 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 all of a sudden right like we just had there was just an earthquake right in california like within the last week i think and um and or the last couple of weeks i guess um and you know it feels like when it happens it feels very sudden like oh this is coming out of nowhere i am in my bed and suddenly i am not right like that that is very but that it's not actually <laughs> it's not actually what's happening you're feeling a moment that's been building and building and building as these plates have shifted right and so to me that is a, a really strong and powerful metaphor for what systemic racism can be where these moments that feel like an eruption right the protests after an incident of police brutality or um you know an entire movement like the civil rights movement or like the black panther movement those those things you know we're like you know we talk about them as though well these black men decided to get guns like this is like out of the blue and weird, <laughs> you know, but it's like, actually these black men decided to defend themselves <laughs> against, right? 400 years of police brutality and, you know, white supremacy and racist violence. And like, that doesn't suddenly sound so weird when you think about it in that context. Um, still complicated, right? Still challenging, but it makes a lot more sense. And so for me, that, that, um, that fire metaphor, right? The spark, the kindling, the embers, like that's, a way of saying, you know, <laughs> not to quote another pop song, but uh, we didn't start this fire, right? The fire has been burning, right? Uh, sorry, Billy Joel, but like, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> that that like that is, I think, a really important idea, right? That 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 the same battle that we are fighting right now in American streets, metaphorically, not, you know, physically, but, you know, the, the thing that we're marching for today, the thing that we're protesting for today is the same thing they were protesting for in the 1910s, the same thing they were protesting for post, you know, civil war and reconstruction. It just looks different now. And so for me, that sense of like fire, right? Like there is sometimes there's a spark and things kind of take fire 
and it dies down, but what does it die down to? It just dies down to embers and all it takes is like a little bit of kindling to get it back up again. And so that to me is what, um, you know, our history of, of activism has been, our history of protest has been. We see this rash of banned book uh, occurrences happening, you know, in schools across the nation. What are your thoughts on all of this? Um, what is it making you think about um, what should educators know um, or, or what is it that you think educators can be thinking about and doing um, in response to this? Mm -hmm. One of the things that's making me think about is just how, how new to our teaching all of the things that people are trying to ban even are. Um, like the fact that we didn't have a Black History Month, we weren't routinely teaching Black American history uh, or world history at all, but, um, you know, specifically African diaspora world history um, in American institutions in certainly not an elementary school, middle school or high school, but even at the college level. And so one of the pieces of organizing that was very important for the Panthers early on around education was getting Black Studies programs and African American Studies programs um, and various other ethnic studies programs that came along with it and after it, um, you know, Asian American Studies, right, Latinx Studies, um, that, that those programs did not exist before the 1960s and it was organizing in the vein of what the Panthers were doing and other groups like them were doing that actually precipitated those programs to be taught at the college level and then it came down to to other um, other levels so that now you do talk about black history like we do know who Rosa Parks was in elementary school which you know I talk about as a limiting way of teaching history right we just teach about these couple of heroes but that represented progress 50 years ago because we didn't teach about those people at all and so to to watch that being eroded now is really heartbreaking because I know how hard we fought as a community as a black community as a community of educators um, as a community of open-minded educators to get those stories told in the first place. And it, I don't think it's a coincidence that the pushback is happening at this moment when those narratives are finally starting to be expanded. We are finally starting to see uh, an expansion beyond that, that very narrow canon of, you know, let's talk about, I mean, literally the canon when I was a child was Rosa Parks and Dr. King, like that was your civil rights canon. And, um, you know, you didn't hear about Ruby Bridges, the young girl who, you know, was the first to desegregate a school in, um, in New Orleans when she was six. You didn't hear about the Little Rock Nine who, you know, endured teasing and bullying all year long, you know, to be the first students to integrate a high school. Like I didn't learn about any of those people when I was young in the Midwest. Right. And so now we're starting to see those stories. We're starting to see our history told. We're starting to see American history told through all of the various lenses that it deserves to be told through. And now in this moment, suddenly there's this pushback that says, no, actually, we want our history the way that it used to be. And so I don't think that that is coincidental. I think it's very troubling. And Kekla, I can remember 20 years ago, I was teaching in a predominantly white school district. It was my first year of teaching. So you can imagine all that, you know, new teachers are navigating in their first years, right? Um, but I was teaching this fifth grade curriculum and using the social studies textbook that was assigned for us to use. And it was a chapter on the three-fifths clause. And um, I got called down to my principal's office to meet with a white parent who complained that I was doing too much black stuff. Now I was the only black teacher K through 12 academic in that district for many, many, many years. So here is this black teacher talking about the three fifths clause and this parent was not having it. And she was like, my son already knows about racism and it's making him feel bad. Um, and what she meant was it was making him feel bad about being white, but what her son was conveying in the classroom very clearly to me and to his peers is what he felt bad about was what happened to black people. Mm -hmm. So we see parents continuing to weaponize the truth and misrepresent empathy, right? We should be glad when children are empathizing, but they're misrepresenting it as, as guilt. And so I'm wondering, you know, what do we say to um, white educators and white parents and caregivers who are looking to avoid books that spotlight the truth 
about racism because they feel like it's making their white children feel bad, Kekla. <laughs> um, you know, I'm imagining you're gonna go and you're gonna talk to schools and kids about this book. And, you know, you may face some of these parents. You may have some teachers who read your book and say, oh my gosh, that's amazing, but I can't teach it because my, my white children might feel bad. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's tricky because I think that we, we want that empathy. Like we want, like, I, I think it's both reasonable and expected and good to feel sad about some of the things that happened in our history, right? I mean, come on, like there's some bad stuff that happened. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to have these conversations with people because part of it, like directly, right, as opposed to in the, in the abstract sense that where we are now, um, because a lot of it is, is grounded in fear. Um, a lot of it is grounded in bias that they don't even understand. Um, you know, you know, people are banning books and like, are you afraid of the book? <laughs> like we, there is a little bit of paper, you know, I think books are powerful and they certainly do carry ideas that are powerful and potentially transformative, but they're also it's a little bit of paper and it's gonna be okay. And this is a safe way to have really challenging conversations, right? Like I don't necessarily want, you know, the first time, you know, somebody experiences the concept of racism to be witnessing it in the real world, right? Like that's very scary, right? We hope that we don't see that. We hope that that we're able to move beyond that as a culture. Like, so the way to understand the things that are behind a lot of our experiences is to read about them and to talk about them in a safe space, like a classroom. Um, and so I think that, I think that sometimes the fear of what could happen in the real world sometimes colors the things that we are afraid of looking at on the page um, when it should be the opposite. Uh, and I also think that this, this, I find this guilt, this sort of guilt question or this like, I feel bad about being white question really interesting because I, 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 I it, it just has to be a function of privilege because I don't, it's very hard for me to imagine a landscape in which I'm not struggling to understand who I am. I'm not struggling to understand my place in the world. I'm not feeling a little bit bad sometimes about aspects of my identity, right? Like there's like that feels part and parcel with existence to me. And the fact that it doesn't to other people um, is, is, is very, very interesting. And so like the, the idea, I mean, I guess the sort of immediate question that would come to mind if I was actually faced with such a parent would be to say, okay, so, you know, what, what kinds of sadness are you comfortable with your child experiencing? Like, let's talk about that because mm -hmm. we, there's a lot of bad and scary things that we teach our, in our history, right? I don't think that we're gonna see a landscape where we're, not at, where we're asked not to teach about the Revolutionary War right um or the vietnam war or the civil war right like, i mean the, the way we talk about it is one thing but the the those those are facts of history that people i've never heard anybody say they don't think the civil war was a thing right the way that you know they say they you know there's a lot of things that people deny about history um and and so for me it's like we can talk about violence in the landscape of all the wars that our country has fought why isn't that sad? Why isn't that scary? Why isn't that upsetting? Mm -hmm. But it's sad and scary and upsetting to hear about black people suffering at the hands of white people systemically, right? Um, so I think that there's a kind of, there's a weird yes. layering to it in terms of how white people feel about racism. And so that's the parent saying, I feel guilty about things that have happened in the past that my ancestors have perpetuated and that I continue to perpetuate unconsciously or consciously and I don't want my child caught in that same loop I want him to be free of that but there is no free of that because that's the world that we live in and so I just think it's a function of privilege to believe that you can rise above that kind of reality and rise above pain and yeah and yeah and I and I think you know in all of my years of teaching children I think children feel bad when they feel helpless, when they don't feel like they have agency to make change. And I think part of it is these, some parents are concerned about their child coming home and saying to them, did you know about this? <laughs> what are we doing to make things better? And yeah. so if you have an answer to that, right, we are striving to be anti-racist in this house. 
Um, we're doing this in these ways, yeah. right? And being able to name some ways, then I don't think that children will feel bad. They will feel empowered um, because they're working to make a difference, to make a change, to disrupt what has been and what continues to be. Um, yeah. And unfortunately see this weaponization against the word anti-racist as well, um, that you know, really to me just plays a part in, you know, if you're weaponizing that word, um, it's because the implication is that yes, racism exists and that perhaps you don't wanna do anything about it. So that's the reality I think folks need to face. Your works demonstrate incredible range from realistic fiction. Um, so we've got the season of Sticks Malone um, to obviously to non historical fiction, um, biography. And these are just some of the books that I happen to have handy on me right now. Um, so we always know, Kekla, to expect greatness from you. What can you share with us about some of the projects you're working on now and next? Ooh. What can we look All forward right. to? <laughs> All right. Um, well, um, I have uh, quite a, a few things in progress as as always um the i mean i am at this moment actually writing a ya novel um that i can't say much about because i'm still figuring out what it's about and pretend if my editor is watching that she did not hear me say that because uh, <laughs> i'm supposed to know what my books are about um, but in terms of books that are actually coming out next um, I have a middle grade novel from the same publisher as The Season of Sticks Malone um, that is called Chester Keen Cracks the Code, and it is about a sixth grade boy who is um, trying to solve some clues in his in his in his neighborhood. So there's a little spy craft, there's a little laser tag, and some bowling and making friends, trying to find your place, because I'm always writing about making friends and trying to find your place. Um, and then I'm very excited about uh, a middle grade series that I am co-writing with Cynthia Lydic smith And this is a graphic novel series from Candlewick that will be out. The first book uh, is out in fall 22. And this is, it's called the Blue Stars series. And so this is, this is, as I said, graphic novel. Um, and so it is about two cousins, one loosely based on me <laughs> and one loosely based on Cynthia. <laughs> so they're uh, cousins in a black and native family and um, they move to live with their grandmother and start sixth grade together in the same school um, and become superheroes in their community because, you know, there's some grownups that are up to no good in that town and the children are the only answer as always. Um, so it's been so much fun working on that series with Cynthia, getting to co-write, getting to explore graphic novels. I bring, you know, my certain experience and she is much more experienced in graphic literature than I am. And so it's really, really fun um, to learn from her and to experience the writing process together. It's just been really joyful for us. And um, the series is illustrated by Molly Murakami. And so this will be her debut middle grade. And um, we are super, super excited to share, uh, hopefully a cover reveal one day soon and um, to start introducing you to our blue stars. But you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that no matter what genre that I am writing in, if it's fantasy, if it's, you know, science fiction and, you know, chapter books or picture books or whatever, like I'm always contemporary fiction, historical fiction, like it's always in the same sort of thread and in the same vein. And it feels like it all kind of, fits mm -hmm. together into this this bigger picture about not just civil rights but being someone who makes a difference being someone who finds a way to use their voice being a, someone who finds a way to connect with other people in service of a bigger a bigger picture and i feel like that's that's always underpinning all of these stories so even though they seem quite disparate <laughs> when you look at my body of work um, they actually do all have threads that that come back to the same spool in the author's note in Revolution in Our Time, um, you write that we can change the world from the time we are very young, from the moment we realize there are injustices to correct. And you say that this involves steeping ourselves in the history of revolutionary movements until we understand the heart and soul of what it means to fight a revolution. Kekla, you are a revolution and your work is an uprising that validates Black people 
and proclaims all of the ways that Black people matter. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? You know, in this moment, in, in, in the context of this particular book and the writing of this particular book and the need for this particular book to be written and so forth, um, the thing that sort of resonates with me about being a Black creator in this moment with this book is just that sense of being part of a, of a lineage, that sense of being part of a legacy that's bigger than myself. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I can talk all about, you know, sort of my own process and my own experiences and the research and all these things, but, you know, but in the end, it's that same thing where I, I don't want to be a, an island, right? I don't want to be just this little, um, you know, spark in the middle of nowhere, right? To use my own metaphor, you know, I want to be connected to, you know, the blaze. I want my spark to be, to hit the kindling, right? Like I want, like, I want to be part of this, um, this bigger conversation, you know, in terms of, you know, Black essayists and Black historians and Black novelists. And, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, reading always like I'm trying, you know, to catch up on like Octavia Butler's like entire body of work, which I'm like way behind on. But like, you know, I just, I think about, you know, people like that who are so just powerful in their storytelling and powerful in their person. And, you know, like James Baldwin, right? Like when I think about, you know, the types of work that I want my work to be in conversation with, you know, and Audre Lorde, I love, you know, I mean, I just, I, I, you know, go through these moments of looking at my bookshelf and thinking, how do I even have titles on the shelf, you know, with these people? I mean, you know, my stuff isn't shelved anywhere near <laughs> right? their work, but it could be, right? Like I'm an M, Toni Morrison's an M, like we could be right there, right? You know, um, and so like, that's, that's something that, you know, as a black creator, it's this aspiration, right? To say, I want to, I want to speak in ways that matters. And this inheritance of, oh, look at what has gone before me and I want to be part of this tradition. I want to speak into this conversation. I want to participate in this. And so to me, that sense of picking up what has been put down already and then using my voice to make my mark to potentially inspire and, and instruct and affect and empower right young readers that are coming behind me and young writers that are coming behind me as part of why I teach as well, I think, um, to, to, to keep that connection and foster that connection and to keep those bridges going um, because none of us are writing in a vacuum, none of us are an island, we are part of this bigger conversation. And to me that, that, that can be really comforting in the times when I'm completely by myself sitting alone with my stacks of Panther research <laughs> going, all right, like I am, I am, you know, reading the words of Asada Shakur. I'm reading, you know, the words of Elaine Brown. I'm reading, you know, these essays and watching, you know, Erica Huggins speak or something. Like I'm, I'm part of this thing that's bigger than myself. Part of this, this, this conversation and this, this creative force. Um, and so it's both humbling and empowering to see myself as part of that and to see myself even being in that conversation. I think we, we fall down sort of at the moment we say, I can't possibly be good enough. To, to, to speak in this place. I can't possibly, like my voice isn't big enough. And, you know, sure, my voice is small, but, you know, everybody's voice is small. You just say things <laughs> and hope that it lands somewhere. Um, and so for me, that I draw strength from, from that example. Mm. Thank you, Kekla. And congratulations again on, your, on being a finalist for the National Book Awards um, for the incredible revolution in our time. If you have not ordered this yet, please do not delay. Um, and we are rooting for you. Thank you. <laughs> I will find Thank out you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation and are moved and inspired to share this powerful story of the Black Panthers with your students so they learn the truth and know they are not too young to participate and make change. Please join us in December for the next conversation in the series. Our guest will be award-winning illustrator, Eric Velasquez. For a full schedule of conversations, please visit blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com.